Hello and welcome, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes. My name is Erica. I'm Gutsick Gibbon. And what we do on this channel is we tackle scientific topics like biological anthropology, zoology, paleontology, etc., etc., etc. And we sometimes look at these topics under the lens of debunking pseudoscience. Today we're tackling a somewhat familiar topic, but that's just because YouTube Young Earth creationists cannot stop trying to pick a fight with me. Well, they just don't know when to quit, do they? I warn them too. I am like the monster from It Follows. Once I've got a scent on a particular topic, I will just beat that topic into the ground until understanding is had. I call it persistence, but some might consider it a character flaw. Anyways, the usual suspects are at it again. Donnie Deals of the Standing for Truth YouTube channel, a Young Earth creationist YouTube channel, has decided to cover my most recent video that was discussing his bungling of the human chromosome 2 fusion. All right, looks like we're live here on Standing for Truth. So let's get some concepts out of the way first so I make sure we're all on the same page. Chromosomes are bundles of genetic information that contain the instructions to make cells and keep them running. They're typically discussed in their unpaired numbers or in their paired numbers, and organisms all across the tree of life vary in the number of chromosomes that they have. Our superfamily is no exception. We are hominoids, so we're apes. This is the sort of category right above the great ape category. It basically just includes gibbons. Now, gibbons vary just extremely in their chromosome number. Some gibbons have 38, some gibbons have 52, while the great apes are a little bit more constrained. Great apes consist of us, the panins, so chimps and bonobos, gorillans, and pongins. Hopefully those are self-explanatory. Humans of the great apes, the hominids, are the only species that has 46 chromosomes, while the others have 48. Okay then, so evolution makes a super simple prediction. If we humans share a common ancestor with the rest of the great apes, then one of two things must have happened. Either a fission event, which caused in several lineages of the other great apes a fission to occur, and the chromosome count to go from 46 in our common ancestor to 48 in all of them, or a fusion event occurred, just in humans, where our number went from 48 to 46. Obviously, the latter hypothesis is more parsimonious because it requires fewer steps. So we have this really simple hypothesis then. Sometime in the past 7 million years, which is the approximate date that we split from chimpanzees, that our lineage, the hominin, split from the panins, we must have experienced a fusion event. Two ancient ape chromosomes fused to form one of the human chromosomes. And since we get chromosomes from both our parents, this would reduce the total number from 48, as in the ancestral condition, that still had in all of the other great apes today, to 46, the condition seen only in humans. And we should be able to find that fusion site in the human genome, like a smoking gun. When chromosome numbers were first available for humans and chimpanzees, human chromosome 2 was singled out as the chromosome that experienced this fusion event due to the similarity it had with chimpanzee chromosomes 12 and 13. This is called homology or syntony. Now, some of the best support in scientific ideas comes when you make a prediction of something before you actually investigate that thing, and then the prediction comes to fruition. This is something that young earth creationists do not seem to understand because they constantly confuse prediction with accommodation. The prediction for human chromosome 2 showed up in 1972 in a book titled Comparative Karyotypes of Primates. Authors Cherlow and Grouchy wrote a chapter titled Karyotypes of Man and Chimpanzee, Comparison of the Topography of Bands, Possible Evolutive Mechanisms, which contains the first prediction of the human chromosome 2 fusion to my knowledge. This prediction was made just on the basis of really brute, basic homology between chromosome 2 and the humans, 2, 12, and 13, and our closest living relatives, the panins. So what actual evidence would we have to find to support this idea? Chromosomes are structured in an orderly way. They look like X's with a centromere at the center of the X and telomeres at the ends of each X's arm. Now, these centromeres and telomeres are identifiable as such by repeated sequences of DNA that are only found in such high densities at these locations in particular. The purpose of telomeres and centromeres is also pretty well understood. 
Telomeres are meant to protect genetic material and centromeres bind the chromosomes during cell division. So then, if two ancient ape chromosomes fused to create human chromosome 2, then we should find the remains of telomeres in the middle of the chromosome, where the fusion occurred, as well as a second centromere somewhere else in the chromosome. In addition to this, the regions outside the fusion site in human chromosome 2 should share enormous similarity with chimp chromosomes 12 and 13, given these are the chromosomes proposed to have fused in the human lineage, while remaining separate in other living hominids. This pattern should also be repeatable. We should find these same characteristics diagnostic of a fusion in other animals proposed to have undergone such a process. In my previous video, I emphasized that we have indeed found the fusion site itself as well as the second cryptic centromere. You see, as I mentioned previously, centromeres and telomeres both have respective calling cards that diagnose them as such. These calling cards are repetitive sequences of DNA, and in telomeres we know it from a six nucleotide string, TTAGGG in forward and CCCTAA in reverse. We know this because these sequences are found in massive densities at regular old telomeres on every single chromosome in basically all animals. Centromeres are known from a more convoluted sequence that we call an alphoid repeat. So then, to reiterate with a bit more information, if a fusion occurred between two ancestral ape chromosomes, then we should find telomere calling cards in the middle of a human chromosome where the fusion occurred in forward and reverse, and alphoid repeats clustering twice in that same chromosome, once for the regular centromere and the other for the second cryptic one. Now, critically, as I've said in every video on this topic, we should find both calling cards in high densities. This is because the density is a part of the prediction itself. Telomeres and centromeres have lots of these repeated motifs, not just one or two. So if the fused chromosome exists, these high densities should as well. It should stand out as unique in the genome. We also know that ITSs, intrachromosomal telomeric sequences, can occur in single or handfuls of sequences outside of the fusion events, and that alphoid repeats can exist in extended centromeric regions. The density of the fusion-specific regions distinguishes them from these other genetic shenanigans. Of course, extensive work throughout the years has revealed this fusion event in glorious detail. We know that human chromosome 2 is, in fact, the result of a fusion between ancestral ape chromosomes 12 and 13. This is why we've actually redesignated 12 and 13 in chimpanzees as 2A and 2B. We have the fusion site itself, a 798 base pair sequence with head-to-head -head telomeric repeats in high densities, and we also have the cryptic centromere. None of this is controversial in comparative genomics, full stop. Young Earth creationists don't like the fusion site because, as we all know, they believe that they are special creations set apart from all other animals and perhaps literally made in the image of God. So the fusion site is a problem because, one, it unites us with other animals, specifically as having descended from a more basal ape, and two, it's an excellent example of a fulfilled prediction by evolutionary theory, which we all know is the gold standard of science. This is why Donnie, a YouTube Young Earth creationist, responded to the video, and I have some things to say about it. Now, in my previous video, I demonstrated some of the support for the Fusion site on camera. I showed you how to use Online Blast, and I searched the Fusion site, showing that the site is found in its full 798 base pair length, only once in the entire human genome, within human chromosome 2. I also narrowed down the search to just the Fusion site itself, and showed that that was only found once in the entire genome, at the Fusion site, in human chromosome 2. I had done all this again on camera so that you could see exactly what I was searching. Each little letter. So now that you have all the background, we can discuss the response video that Donnie made to that video that I just showed on screen while rending it limb from limb. Because I ran some experiments and I have some thoughts. Great to have you for this uh, late night show where we are going to do a number of things. We're going to refute uh, the chromosome 2 fusion, which has been completely overturned. It's been falsified. We're going to uh, dismantle some of uh, Gutsit Gibbon's video. I've already uh, put out at least one article on the video itself and a 15 to 20 page comprehensive article essentially refuting everything there is to refute on the chromosome 2 fusion. So This is an exciting promise. Surely this time he will follow through. Right? Reduce your expectations to zero. I'll play a couple uh, clips 
from Erica's video proving that yet again, we have an evolutionist with egg all over their face. And so this should, this should be fun. Donnie isn't known for his creative or funny insults. Now you may have noticed his partner in crime there. That's Raw Matt. Raw Matt is a former breatharian, those guys who believe that you can like breathe your food without having to eat. And uh, he is known for being busted for faking a published paper in PNAS uh, by using Photoshop. This guy has achieved a level of loser that science didn't even think possible. So we are going to ignore him almost entirely in this video because he very rarely has anything of worth to say. Although he does say what might be the only true thing that I've ever heard Ramad say in this video, which is pretty monumental when you think about it. I figured uh, I like to have some hard debates, right? I like, to, I like the subjects that are really hard to defend. One of those things being extreme longevity and the other one, the age of the earth, right? How can you defend a position where the evidence is against you? I'm like, bring it on. That's exactly what we do here. We're just saying the quiet part out loud, aren't we, Matt? How do you defend a position where the evidence is against you? Yeah, how, how do you do that? How does one do that? We attack the hardest arguments and we give the audience the best answers that we can possibly give. Yeah, so again, Raw Matt defends some pretty ludicrous ideas even outside of Young Earth creationism, but he's also quite fond of, I guess, arguing that people in the Old Testament like Methuselah actually live to be like 900 and stuff like that. So, you know, again, we're going to ignore what he has to say for the most part. Now, next, Donnie talks about something very interesting. He talks about how when it comes to proving or disproving common ancestry, the only thing that really matters is genetics. And so, Matt, you and I are firm believers that the best way to answer the question of ancestry is in our genetics. It's our genes, traits, it's our genetics that are inherited sperm and egg. Not a rock, not geology, not geography, not a bone found in the dirt. And so we put a lot of work into the world of genetics and basically confirming separate ancestry, but also, as you said, providing the strongest rebuttals to the best so-called challenges and arguments coming from the evolutionist side. So whether that's chromosome two fusion, endogenous retroviruses, arguments against a literal Adam and Eve, argu arguments against genetic entropy, we are here to dismantle those. This is obviously not true. The case for common ancestry comes from the preponderance of various different fields all working together and corroborating one another. Genetics with the fossil record, the fossil record and genetics with the geologic column, and so on and so forth. I personally think that Donnie likes to hide behind genetics because it's the hardest of the various fields for a layperson to understand, and so you can kind of spew a bunch of different jargon and terminology at people, and you can kind of sound like you know what you're talking about. Case in point, Nathaniel Jeanson, who we will get to eventually. But for our purposes today, if Donnie wants to stick with genetics, we can stick with genetics. Let's see what happens. I leave no stone unturned. Throughout this article, I put evolutionist claim. You know, this is the argument they're making. DDX 11L2 genes, a pseudogene, something like that. And then I refute it comprehensively. So it would be a huge surprise, that I think, to us both if an evolutionist out there were to actually uh, refute this article. Surprise! We're going to do that. We're going to refute the article. The article that was published on Donnie's blog website not a journal. The article that cites Jeffries Hopkins, yes, that one, over five times. The article that has no consistent format to its bibliography, that article. We're going to do it through the lens of this video, however, and when we need to get extra context or more in-depth into Donnie's arguments, we will refer to the article. Point by point, page by page, in a sophisticated and comprehensive manner. I really don't think it will happen because the arguments that I refute in this article are basically the best arguments that people like Guts at Gibbon have put forth in, in their videos. Yeah, you know what they say, science moves forward one blog post at a time. I'm obviously just kidding. It moves forward one 5 a.m. live stream at a time. So next, Donnie plays a clip from my video where I accuse him of simply recapitulating Jeffrey Tompkins' work instead of doing the work for himself. And in the clip that I had utilized to kind of support that case, Donnie's talking about how you can find those telomere-specific calling cards elsewhere in the genome at places that aren't just the fusion site, effectively arguing against the case that it is, in fact, a fusion site. 
This is a notion that I had heard from Jeffrey Tompkins before. Not that Dr. Tompkins' work isn't trustworthy, but my point is this specific argument in this video that was laid out was a novel argument that Chris Roop and I uncovered by searching the genome using BLAST, searching the genome to see if what Erica is saying is true. <laughs> what I find funny is Erica in her video, she tries to say that, oh, Donnie, do you have the memory of a goldfish? And I'm wondering if she has the attention span of a goldfish because it's impossible to miss in this debate, firstly, she accuses me of just taking already published data from Dr. Tompkins and basically repeating it and just blindly trusting that it's true. Now, I had initially found out that Donnie was spouting off incorrect information about human chromosome 2 due to a link someone sent me of a clip that was found within like a multi-hour live stream. I think it's like three or four hours by Donnie. So I watched that portion of the clip and then I was like, this is incorrect, I should correct it, and I used it as a springboard to talk about the human chromosome 2 fusion. But in doing so, I neglected to do my due diligence and actually watch the entire three hour stream that Donnie had posted. Typically when I cover the content of Standing for Truth or other creationist YouTube channels, I watch the entire video, however long it may be, and clip out the portions that are relevant to my video that are effectively important to respond to. This time I didn't. I basically made a video around a shortened clip and missed out on key information, such as the fact that Donnie and his buddy Christopher Roop, author of This Monstrosity, or co-author of This Monstrosity, actually did some analyses themselves. They weren't simply recapitulating Jeffrey Tompkins' work. They did their own experiments. So Donnie, as I said in our email exchange, which is going to come up again later, my mistake. I accused you of simply using Jeffrey Tompkins' work when you did some work yourself. I didn't watch your entire three hour stream, and so I didn't know that this was your work instead of just Jeffrey Tompkins' work that you were sort of regurgitating onto the screen. Again, my mistake. I can admit when I'm wrong. Can you? You know what, if I get a sufficient response to that, I'll admit that currently there, there's no solution to the heat problem. But just because this is an argument that you and Roop made doesn't mean that it is a good or correct argument. So let's address it, the one that you two made. So next they play a clip from my video where I say that the fusion site is the only place where we find the fusion site sequence. Okay, I almost want to play it again. So you heard her say it um, loud and clear. The chromosome 2 area, the so-called fusion site, the 798 base pair signature. That's the only place she says, and she said this in her uh, previous video, where she initially made the challenge a year to a year and a half ago. And so she reiterated it there. I was going to play the first video, but she reiterated it here. So, and this is the most recent video from a couple days ago, a few days ago. And so here it is right from Erica's mouth. It's the only place in the entire genome, the chromosome two, where you find the uh, telomeric sequences, these uh, repeats in both forwards and backwards, T-T-A-G-G-G, C-C-C-T-A-A, in a head-to-head -head fashion. Kate, so here's that clip. The only place that you find the fusion site in forward and reverse, it's in human chromosome two. Nowhere else, as we just saw. Right, the fusion site is the only place where we find the fusion site's unique signature. If you take the fusion site and search that sequence elsewhere in the genome, you blast it against the rest of the genome, you can't find it anywhere else. I didn't search a pristine head-to-head -head telomere to telomere sequence, and we'll talk about why later, but this is the straw man that he moves forward with. So to be clear really quickly here, right? I searched the fusion site itself in my previous video, and Donnie and Rube claimed to have proved me wrong because they searched something different in theirs, and they found a pristine head-to-head telomere-telomere sequence in their own analysis. Put that to the side for a moment because I want to clear something else up here, and that is the nature of finding telomere calling cards elsewhere in the genome that aren't just human chromosome 2 or the telomeres themselves. So I don't think that I've ever said that human chromosome 2 is the only place where we find the telomere calling cards outside of telomeres. In fact, in the very first debate that Donnie and I had on this subject, which was years ago on Modern Day Debate, I said the opposite without even knowing the data. I would be interested to see, and I would, I would predict 
but they are not found in the same bulk as they are in the center of human chromosome two, because there are two things that make the, the telomeric sequences found in the, in the center of human chromosome two so very important and so very indicative of fusion. And the thing number one is that there's so many of them. You didn't really answer why those internally located clusters of telomere sequences are more common in the genome than just you know where we're looking and why they are now found to be extremely important. Oh, no, but I did because it's context specific. The fact that we're finding the telomeric sequence in, in the center of this chromosome, chromosome two, in massive bulk in comparison to where we find them elsewhere in, in the human genome is very, very indicative of a fusion site. The density of the telomere telomere calling cards in the center of human chromosome two is half the argument, which is something that I've mentioned in every video that I've made on this subject. You're probably going to find isolated telomeric repeats once or twice elsewhere in the genome. The telomere calling card is six base pairs long, and the human genome is several billion with a B base pairs long. You're probably going to get the telomere calling card by random chance a few times, completely excluding duplications and inversions and other genetic shenanigans. But things actually get worse because, remember, Donnie is arguing with a straw man here. She obviously rushed to it. She must have watched three minutes of it, got triggered, didn't even notice me saying this is data here in this document on the screen that Chris Roop and I came up with when we decided to test her argument. We want to see if that's actually true, because if that was true, that may be one point for the evolutionist side. But you guys didn't test my argument. You tested a different argument. Remember, I searched the fusion site, something that you could check by looking at the screen with your eyes or listening to me literally read out the letters <laughs> that I searched that aren't a pristine head-to-head telomere-telomere sequence. And just so you can see really what we did, let's scroll up and open up the job details so you can see the actual sequence that I searched. It was a sequence that goes A, G, 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 T, T, A, G, C, T, A, 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 C, C, T, A, A, C, 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 T, A, A. There's our fusion site. You guys tested the latter. These are not the same. The reason why the fusion site is important to search for instead of the pristine head-to-head -head sequence is for two reasons. One, the fusion site represents the density, and two, the fusion site is degenerate, both of which are going to be important, again, when we get to it in a moment. Here in chromosome 9, it's pristine, and that's why I'm emphasizing uh, chromosome 9 specifically. So just to be abundantly clear here, in my video, what I blasted on screen was the fusion site. I took the fusion site and blasted it out to see if we could find it anywhere else in the genome. The fusion site being characterized by high density telomeric repeats that are super degraded, but found in high quantities. Again, high density. Donnie and Roop, well, really Roop, Roop is the one who actually operated BLAST, blasted out a pristine telomere-telomere sequence head-to-head -head and found it in low density in one place, chromosome 9. So if Erica actually would have watched the video and paid attention, she wouldn't have put out a video that was just so riddled with misrepresentations, misunderstandings, straw man arguments. So the primary point of that video was to highlight something really, really silly that you said, Donnie, which was that the density argument for the fusion site was moving the goalposts. Don't shift the goalposts. Don't say, well, it's the number of sequences. That wasn't the challenge. The challenge was to show us one other area in the genome. I made the video to show you that no, that has always been a part of the argument. What I missed in doing that was that you and Roop had run the experiment yourself and that you guys had found a head-to-head -head pristine telomere-to-telomere -to -telomere sequence in chromosome 9. Now, mind you, it is still true that you said that the density is moving the goalposts, and that's not the case. So the video stands with regard to arguing against that point. Still, you guys did find this head-to-head -head telomeric sequence in chromosome 9, and I do think that that's worth addressing systematically so. It is funny though because he complains that my video is like 40 minutes long as if that's just incredibly taxing to have to, to have to sit through. My brother in Christ, you have eight hour live streams, some of which start at like 12 a.m. Compared to you, I'm concise. Me. Again, she must have either just watched a few minutes of it, got triggered based on something that I said, assumed that I was arguing a point that I actually wasn't making, and then went and made this 30 to 40 minute video responding to something that 
was basically misrepresenting what I said in the video. Again, the video was primarily made to argue with your statement that the density argument is moving the goalposts, which it definitively isn't. Don't shift the goalposts. Don't say, well, it's the number of sequences. So no, I didn't misrepresent your argument. I simply made an error in supposing that you were recapitulating Tomkins' work instead of talking about something that you had done yourself. So you'll notice here, chromosome 9. TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA. So the point is, we find these uh, telomeric repeats in both forwards and in reverse, the reverse complement, because DNA is double-stranded. We find it in the chromosome uh, 9. So nobody's going to say that this has anything to do with a fusion. This answers her challenge. And this is something she did not address in her video. And her video, again, was responding to a video of mine where I actually presented this data, but it completely went went over her head. No, Donnie, it didn't go over my head. I didn't see it because I didn't watch the whole video. This is why I typically do include clips in your overly gratuitously long live streams where I take apart each thing that you guys say. I didn't do it this time, but I will rectify that mistake now. Now, yes, she shifts the goalpost, she moves to the density. Don't be such a weasel, Donnie. The density has always been a part of the argument. Look, you're doing it again. Did you watch the video that you say you watched? I'm in the same bulk is that there's so many of them in massive bulk. In high density, such density is in high density, extremely high density. That's to say the full density, the high density of alphoid repeats in their high density. She see a high density of alphoid repeats. It's about the density. It's always been about the density. Why is the density important? Those high densities are what characterize the telomeres themselves in high densities, not just once. 50% of her argument's been destroyed. Then she moves to, well, the chromosome 2 area comprises the highest density of these repeats. Okay, well, well, we'll deal with that. I did deal with it in my article. But the point is, she has said over and over again, and evolutionists have repeated over and over again that, no, we don't find these sequences, TTA, GGG, CCC, TAA, okay, it, head to head, anywhere else in the genome. In such high densities. Yes, you're forgetting that part of the argument. That's the critical part of the argument. That's part of it, again. And we falsified that argument. We, we absolutely demolished that challenge. So I realize that we're almost 30 minutes into this video that you're currently watching, and we still haven't actually talked about the argument itself. But Donnie just keeps saying incorrect things that merit us to stop, that merit us to take a pause and examine. And what he says next is no exception. But also um, some, some very sophisticated work done by Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins. So she thinks that all you find is independent, isolated instances of TTA, GGG here, maybe over here, CCC, TAA as a reverse complement, but never head to hand, head. And that's what she's saying. Well, maybe that's what they found. But as you can see, no, <laughs> that's not just what we found. Okay, so let's finally get into this a little bit. Having established that Donnie and Roop tested something that I never said, they searched for a pristine head-to-head -head sequence while I searched for the actual fusion site, let's get into the argument. What did they find? Donnie is basically saying here that chromosome 2 as a fusion site doesn't matter because it isn't really unique in sequence. The fact, he argues, that chromosome 9 has a head-to-head -head sequence nullifies the importance of chromosome 2s. So remember that the head-to-head -head calling cards were only part of the argument. They also had to be in high density and in the middle of a large chromosome. In addition, the fusion site is argued thanks to the presence of an additional cryptic centromere and overall syntony with chimpanzee 2a and 2b. So let's just compare the two sites. Let's compare human chromosome 2, which is supposed to be a fusion site, and human chromosome 9, which has this additional signal that Donnie and Roop have found. We can assess them for what we would expect of a fusion site and really test the case. We can see if human chromosome 2 is one, unique in its sequence, and two, meets the expectations of the fusion site, and we can look at the same for human chromosome 9. If chromosome 9 is also unique and also passes the expectation for a fusion site, then maybe human chromosome 2 is bunk. Maybe it isn't truly a fusion site. However, if it is unique, and if it does pass all of the expectations for a fusion site to the exclusion of human chromosome 9, well, then it's probably a fusion site, and Donnie probably has some trouble on his hand. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Let's home in on the fusion site itself for the time being. Remember that the head-to-head -head nature of the fusion site is important, but something that we haven't really talked about is the degenerate nature of the site itself. 
which is also absolutely critical. Allow me to explain. Remember that chromosomes are capped with telomeres, and the purpose of these telomeres is to protect the chromosome from degradation during replication and to prevent fusion with neighboring chromosomes. These regions are themselves buffered by subtelomeric regions, which look like telomeres sequentially, although they are degraded in comparison. It is in these subtelomeric regions that we also tend to find genes that are members of the DDX11L family, which will be important later. What this means is that in order for a fusion event to occur, the telomeres themselves must be absent or have failed in some way, leaving the subtelomeric regions open to fusion. Meaning that if you find telomeric sequences in a pristine condition, even head to head, it is likely not a fusion, but the result of duplication events, inversions, and frame shifts. So for the fusion to occur, degradation is necessary on the outset. And on top of that, the degradation may later be exacerbated because tandem repeats are typically unstable. So, so far, with regard to head-to-head -head sequences located in the human genome, we have human chromosome 2 and human chromosome 9. Human chromosome 2 is degenerate in nature and significantly larger, while human chromosome 9 is pristine and significantly smaller. In fact, the repeats that were found by Donnie and Roop are about 10% the size of the total fusion site in human chromosome 2. So, so far chromosome 9 is significantly smaller than human chromosome 2, and it has pristine repeats instead of the expected degraded repeats. But here we can really hammer home the concept by looking at other animals that are proposed to have experienced chromosomal fusions in the same way as human chromosome 2, so telomere to telomere fusions. Because we should see the same thing there, right? We should see a degenerate fusion site in the middle of a chromosome that is proposed to be the one that experienced a fusion. So let's take a look. We'll start with suids, so pigs. And the reason we're gonna start with them is because young earth creationists accept them as related animals. They think that all pigs, all members of suidae are related to an ancestral group that walked off of Noah's Ark and then diversified into their existing forms. Thereby, if a fusion event occurred in one of these existing species, they have to accept it as a legitimate fusion event. Chromosome 6 in the modern pig has been proposed to be a fusion of the ancestral chromosome 14 and 6, which appear separate still in the modern Babarusa. This was initially supported by banding, just as chimp 12 and 13 were to human 2 many moons ago, but further work has confirmed a fusion, subtelomeric and telomeric repeats at the center of pig chromosome 6. Fascinatingly, they note that the fusion required degeneration in order to happen, so their fusion site looks like human chromosome 2's fusion site, not the signal at human chromosome 9. This is something that effectively all young earth creationists, at least the ones that subscribe to the answers in Genesis kinds, have to accept because it occurred after the diversification within the family Suidae, which they think is a kind of animal that God created and then allowed to diversify. Uh oh Donnie, your kinds are killing you again, they're getting you, look out! So under the kind system, young earth creationists do accept that telomere to telomere fusions happen and that these fusions require degradation, resulting in non-pristine fusion sites. This work has stood this test of time and more and more types of fusions have been discovered within the Suidae family. So we have established that telomere to telomere fusions do happen and that degradation is necessary for them to happen, thereby degradation characterizes fusion sites. But what then is actually going on in human chromosome 9? It's a pristine head-to-head -head sequence of telomeric repeats. Can conventional science explain it? We will now consider the equids, specifically horses and zebras, since young earth creationists also accept them as being related. Zebras have fewer chromosomes than horses, the latter of which is closer to their shared ancestor's position. As such, zebras experienced several fusion events, some of which were telomere-telomere, while horses evidently did not. Extensive work on both horses and zebras reveals that not only can we find the fusion sites in the latter, but we also find ITSs of non-fusion types in the former. An ITS, remember, stands for Intrachromosomal Telomeric Sequence. Okay, everybody, we are back on Ensemble, and this time we have searched the pristine telomere-to-telomere head-to-head 
uh, sequence, but we've searched it in the horse, which if you'll remember from the paper that we just looked at, is an animal that does not seem to have an evident fusion site, or at least an evident telomere to telomere fusion site, but does have ITSs, which are just the intrachromosomal telomeric sequences that are not indicative of a fusion site. This is what I'm proposing the situation is in human chromosome 9, so I thought it would be interesting to see if we could find it in an animal that's not argued to have like a put it at fusion site. So here it is, TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA, and forward and reverse about 60 base pairs long give or take. So there's our job, that's what we've searched, and here are our hits. If we click on our first sequence here, so I've sorted them by length, this one is 64 base pairs long, so I said give or take 60 base pairs. This one is pretty long compared to what we actually searched. If we click on the sequence, it's going to take us to the sequence page, and it's going to give us uh, our alignment our, by base pairs down here. So let's take a little peek. So we have TTA, GGG, there it is in forward. TTA, CCC. TAA, CCC, TAA, CCC. So there we go. Right off the bat, we have a little head-to-head -head fusion. Um, I don't like this one though, because it doesn't give us it doesn't give us a specific chromosomal location for this particular alignment. So let's see what else we can find. And of course, the spoiler is I've already like looked at all this stuff. So here in chromosome nine, we have another example. We have TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, TTAA, CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA, CCC. So there it is again, another head-to-head -head fashion. Now, what else can we take a look at? Let's take a look at chromosome 12 here. If we click on it, down to our sequence again, TTA, GGC, TAA, CCC, another head-to-head. A little two little fusion smasheroonie right there. And this tracks, right, with what we've seen for horses, for what we just saw in the paper. These are intrachromosomal telomeric sequences, or at least that's what they appear to be. So we have pigs that exhibit telomere to telomere fusion, similar to what we see in human chromosome two, and horses that exhibit non-fusion ITSs, similar to what we see in human chromosome nine. The former is a fusion and the latter is an ITS. So in our comparison, chromosome two and chromosome nine both have head-to-head -head signatures, but chromosome two has the degenerate signal, while chromosome nine has the pristine signal. The former is indicative of a fusion site and the latter of an ITS. Take this signature, blast it out in the genome, and let's see uh, exact hits on this, on this composition. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but let's see. Because again, there's things that are unique about the chromosome nine signature here, okay, when compared to the chromosome two. And there's things in the chromosome two, like the high density nature of it, that are unique to the chromosome two when compared to the chromosome nine. Okay, one thing about the chromosome nine that's unique doesn't make it a fusion, uh, you know, uh, an example of an ancient fusion in the same way that one thing unique about the chromosome two spot suddenly makes that an example of an ancient fusion. No, that's not how it works. So here again, Donnie wants to write off the fusion site by arguing that density may be unique to the site, but his chromosome 9 ITS has its own unique properties in that it is pristine. And I mean, really, who's to say what is or isn't important or diagnostic in genetics? Except, you know, chromosome 9 wasn't a fulfilled prediction from the 1970s with all of the diagnostic characteristics laid out for a fusion site. The density, remember, is half the argument for the fusion. It's half the argument specifically for the fusion. Okay, so picture a mutt. Me and Donnie look at the mutt and I say to him, wow, this mutt must be a mix of a Rottweiler and a Great Pyrenees because it has the coloring of the former and the double dew claws of the latter. And then Donnie says, no, it probably isn't because he has a mutt that has the coloring of a Rottweiler and also the tail of a Basinji. All mutts are unique, you know, and you can't use the characteristics of my mutt to diagnose it as a Rot Pier mix. Bro, what? The mutts are unique, yes, but mine has the traits that diagnose it as a rot peer mix. It's not arbitrary, it's diagnostic. Chromosome 2 has the head-to-head -head and the density, diagnostic of a fusion site. Chromosome 9 has a pristine head-to-head -head and low density, both indicative of an ITS. And so by dense, she means you've got way more of these head-to-head -head arrays than you do in any other place in the genome, which is true. Because if you look at our chromosome 9 area, Again, it's, we find them meeting her challenge in forwards and reverse, head to head, 
but you'll notice there's not as many found as in the chromosome two spot. So again, not the challenge. I searched for the fusion site, not pristine repeats. But again, those pristine repeats are also one of the things about chromosome nine that make it not a fusion site, in addition to the low density. So next, Bonnie is going to read aloud the base pairs, their head-to-head -head nature in an effort to convince us that it is indeed very pristine. I yes. like how much more pristine it is though in, cr in chromosome nine. It like literally touches, they go back to right. back with each other. Right. And you actually get instances of notice TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG. Look at, they're all just touching each other. They're unbroken. And then right, right away in the head to head um, fashion that she says doesn't exist. CCC, TAA, CCC, TAA. Boy, it really is pristine, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's low in density, but wow, it is startlingly pristine in nature. Almost like you just plucked it out of a telomeric region, huh? I mean, boy, if you found that, that chromosome nine signal, like in the middle of a chromosome, you would be forgiven for thinking that it might be a fusion, like what we see in human chromosome two. Even though the density is so low, you would be forgiven for making such a mistake. I mean, it is in the middle of a chromosome, isn't it? It's not like somewhere else, is it? Like somewhere that might be really common for ITSs? It's not adjacent to the telomeres, is it, Donnie? It is. It is adjacent to the telomeres. It's not in the middle of a chromosome. I've already got it pulled up. So here's our search type. Go to our job details. It's basically the same sequence we just looked at. And the best hit is in chromosome nine. Let's hit the sequence. When we go to take a little peek, it's going to show us the sequence. This was the sequence that Donnie showed, um, the TTA, GGG, and right where the transition occurs is here, TTA, CCC, right off of a uh, TTA, GGG, T, and then there's our little transition. So when we bop back over, scroll down to the bottom to our chromosome nine, we take a peek at where those hits are located and indeed they're right outside the telomeric regions again. So it is an analogous situation to what we saw with the horse. And we can even click on it and like get the actual alignment here. So there's our length 46, which if you'll remember is the same length we just looked at up here, 46 as our length. When we click on it, Again, it's the one located in this area adjacent to the telomeres. You can click on alignment and it's going to show us the same alignment that we just looked at. And surprise, that was the same situation that we saw with the horse. If we scroll down to the bottom where we see our hits represented in a karyotype or in um, a little diagram here, we can see that for 12, there's one hit and for nine, there's one hit. These were the two that we looked at just now and they're both located like right adjacent to telomeric regions. So not only is the chromosome nine situation in humans analogous to horses with regard to them both having characteristics of ITSs, but they're both not found in the middle of chromosomes. Take this signature, blast it out in the genome, and let's see uh, exact hits on this on this composition. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but let's see. Because again, there's things that are unique about the chromosome nine signature here, okay, when compared to the chromosome two. And there's things in the chromosome two, like the high density nature of it, that are unique to the chromosome two when compared to the chromosome nine. Okay, one thing about the chromosome nine that's unique doesn't make it a fusion. Uh, you know, the, an example of an ancient fusion in the same way that one thing unique about the chromosome two spot suddenly makes that an example of an ancient fusion. No, that's not how it works. See, I don't think he actually gets it. Chromosome two is proposed to be a fusion site because every characteristic of it is diagnostic of a fusion site. It mirrors what we see in other animals that have experienced chromosomal fusions in a telomere to telomere fashion that I know young earth creationists accept as such. It's degenerate. It has the head to head telomeric sequences. It's in the middle of the chromosome and those telomeric sequences are also very dense. All four of these characteristics are the opposite of what we see in chromosome nine with the exception of of it does have a head-to-head -head sequence within it, but it's clearly an ITS based off of every other aspect of it. But Donnie doesn't get this. Okay, th so the chromosome nine spot is also unique in its composition because that was Erica's rebuttal. She said, oh, so basically she hasn't really acknowledged public yet, but we'll see if she does uh, publicly that yes, 
we found areas in the genome, specifically this one, where the uh, sequences are found head to head. Okay. And she is going to say that, but the chromosome two area is, it's its own unique composition. Well, so is the chromo chromosome nine is its own unique composition. Isn't that, isn't that very subjective? Matt, because aren't there, we can look to all parts of the genome in many different ways, look at all kinds of DNA elements, DNA uh, sequences, like what we're looking at here and find all kinds of unique compositions that are, let's say, unique to that area in the genome when compared to other spots. He doesn't understand that human chromosomes 2's traits are diagnostic of a fusion site. Every aspect supports a fusion. Nothing in nine does. It's not just that the fusion is unique, it's that the characteristics of the fusion, those traits that are what make it unique, are themselves diagnostic of a fusion site. It's not arbitrary. The traits mean something. I don't know how she missed this. I guess she, I'd like to see basically her state in a video that, yeah, I didn't watch that whole open mic debate because I said it many times. Mark Reed understood it. Grayson understood it. Everybody understood it, that it was Chris Roop and I who did this data. We came up with it, not Dr. Tompkins. From my understanding, he couldn't find this. This is fair enough. I do admit it. I did not watch the entirety of the three hour stream. String me up already. Just put me out of my misery. Also, you guys don't need to be giving people more reasons to think that Jeffrey Tompkins is bad at being a mammal geneticist. He does a fine job with that on his own. So uh, You can't miss it. So she says, I have the memory of a goldfish. He has the attention span of a goldfish, essentially. So yes, it, it, her, her challenge was, uh, was met. It was demolished. I don't know how she missed it com commenting on this video. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't watch the entire three-hour stream, and I missed the fact that you and Roop ran this kill me, just blow me up, I, I deserve it. But you know, here's something that's a little interesting to me. You missed that in my video, I tested the fusion site itself. You missed that and you went ahead and tested something I never tested myself, something that I never proposed should even be tested. So this is kind of weird, right? Cause my video was a third the size of yours. We'll see if you can own your mistakes like I can own mine, but I don't have much hope. You know what? If I get a sufficient response to that, I'll admit that currently there, there's no solution to the heat problem. Then Ramat says something incredibly insulting. She's not responding because she's got to go ask Dr. Dan what to say, what to do, just right. like she had How to do I deal with this. You know? <laughs> Has right. no clue. Like she never did, had any clue with genetic entropy yet. Uh, she she said multiple times in debates and conversations that she has no idea what she's talking about with genetics. Yet Dr. John Sanford and Dr. Jeanson are wrong. Raw Matt, you faked a paper. You are a fraud. And Donnie, you laugh, but you had to get Roop to run your blast analysis, presumably because you couldn't run it yourself. You didn't know how. I took weeks to learn how to use BLAST myself, both the online tool and the much harder offline tool, so that I could test Tompkins' methods. I bothered absolutely everybody I know who might know how to use BLAST to get them to teach me how to use it, because I wanted to know myself. Now, Dan is absolutely brilliant, but he's not a geneticist either. So for this stuff, for this human chromosome 2 stuff and for the Tompkins stuff, I learned it all myself. In fact, this entire channel is completely a solo effort. I do all of the scripts. I source all of my scripts, which means I have to read all of the papers that I'm utilizing in my videos to make sure that I'm understanding them correctly. And when I'm reading outside of my area of expertise, this takes like quintuple the time. I do all my own animations. I edit everything all alone. All of this while handling my actual job as a teacher of a biological anthropology lab at university and my course load and dissertation work as an actual PhD student. I'm fine with a lot. I'm a woman in academia and I'm a woman on the internet, so I don't get offended very easily. But to try and denigrate the work that I've done, to try to reduce my efforts to some kind of helpless caricature that you've created of me is vile and frankly, cucked. If your efforts against what I do on this channel are so pitiable that you have to attack my capability as a scientist, well, then you're in worse shape than I thought. Fortunately, as offensive as that section was, it won't hinder our actual work here. So let's get back to systematically vivisecting the work that you guys have done in order to debunk or deconstruct conventional science. So notice here from this uh, secular paper, Matt, they're asking if the fusion occurred within the telomeric repeat, 
arrays less than 6 million years ago. Why are the arrays at the fusion site so degenerate? And so these guys, they like to posture and say, oh, this isn't an issue. This was expected. Oh, really? It doesn't sound like it was expected. It actually sounds like it was unexpected. They actually yeah. sound surprised. Isn't that right, Matt? So we've already discussed why degradation is necessary for a fusion to occur. And we've even discussed other animals that have degradation at proposed fusion sites that creationists ostensibly accept as animals who have undergone a fusion. So I think what we'll do here is we'll just touch on a little bit of rhetoric. Dunny reads an excerpt from a 2002 paper that asks why the site is degenerate, as if asking the question illustrates sheer surprise. Now, maybe the authors were surprised, I don't know, but I very much doubt it given we know the general way that telomere-telomere fusions occurred before this paper came out, and that degradation is typically necessary. I know this based off of the numerous papers discussing the topic, and the next several sentences after the one Donnie reads. Quote, there are three possible explanations. One, given the many instances of degenerate telomeric arrays within the subtelomeric regions of human chromosomes, the chromosomes joined at an interstitial array near, but not actually at, their ends. In this case, material from the very ends of the fusion partners would have been discarded. Two, the arrays were originally true terminal arrays that degenerated rapidly after the fusion. This high rate of change is plausible given the remarkably high allelic variation observed at the fusion site. The arrays at the BAC and the sequence obtained by Ijo et al. in 1991 differ by 12%, which is high even if some differences are ascribed to the experimental error. Three, some array degeneracy could be a consequence of sequencing errors. We have not been able to PCR successfully across the fusion site, which would be required to assess the contribution of sequencing errors to this measure of fusion site sequence polymorphism. However, explanation two is supported by the high variability among allelic copies of other interstitial telomeric repeats and associated regions sequenced by Mandelo et al. 2000. Curious that Donnie would stop reading there, right before the explanation. How out of character! Now, next, Raw Matt gives us another way of potentially proving them wrong. Well, that would be easy because we have uh, sequenced Neanderthal DNA. So why a lot of it may be degenerated, we would be able to see a more pristine fusion uh, area if they were to run it there. So that would be easily checkable as well because they believe that Neanderthal lived hundreds of thousands of years ago. So that to them is a very ancient human being that was more close to the fusion site than us. So therefore, that region should be much more littered with telomeric repeats than the weak degenerated version that they're telling us today. Okay, so the idea here is pretty simple and kind of clever, right? If the fusion occurred between ancient ape chromosomes to form human chromosome 2, and if this fusion occurred before some of our other hominin relatives, like Denisovans or Neanderthals, and it is proposed that this is the case, then they should probably have less degenerate or more basal fusion sites than anatomically modern humans, and this should go for their telomeres as well as for their centromeres. Now, Ramat is talking about this with regard to the fusion site itself, and that is true, but it should also be the case with the second cryptic centromere. Remember, if we're proposing that a fusion is what created human chromosome 2, and in this case Neanderthal chromosome 2 and Denisovan's chromosome 2, then that fused chromosome should not only have a fusion site, but a second centromere, given every chromosome normally has one centromere. The fused one should have two, and that site should also be degenerate. So first, here's a good opportunity to ask, do we find that cryptic centromere? The answer is yes, obviously. Okay, so you guys have seen this Excel spreadsheet before. This is the one that Evograd sent me a long time ago. We could do this in Blast, and it's pretty simple. Just take the alphoid repeats that I've presented to you in this video and blast them like you did the telomere fusion side. Um, but this is a nicer way of looking at the data, so I thought we would just utilize this. So what you can see here is we've got our chromosome, the start and the end of our sequence, the number of repeats of the alphoid repeats, the distance between the blocks, the distance between the block and the centromere, average identity for the repeats of the blocks, the length, and the density of repeats in the block. So what's really important here is the repeats. The higher the repeat number, obviously the more alphoid repeats are present. And you'll see that in yellow, we have uh, just a ton of repeats. These are our normal centromeres, but there's only one place in the human genome where we have a ton of alphoid repeats that isn't the normal centromere, and that's human chromosome two with 185 repeats right here, and it is ridiculously far away from the regular centromere. You'll notice there are a couple of repeats here and there, uh, but they're going to be pretty close to the normal centromere, so they're in what's called an extended centromeric region. There's also chromosome 9, which also represents kind of an oddity, but it's also like chock full of heterochromatin. It's known to be structurally polymorphic, and they're in what's kind of considered to be a secondary extended region. The extended centromeric regions, excuse me, 
Now, um, I want to touch a little bit more on the cryptic centromere here because it's given me an opportunity to gas Glenn Williamson up a little bit more, and you know I love to do that because he's, uh, he's great when it comes to uh, debunking Jeffrey Tompkins' entire career and helping me do the same. So he's done something very clever here that I want to share with you uh, to support the case for the cryptic centromere outside of just that cluster of alphoid repeats. And I think this is nice because it further distinguishes it from the extended centromeric region in chromosome 9. So Glenn makes a pretty simple prediction here. First, he blasts out the uh, alphoid repeats and finds the same location as we did in that Excel spreadsheet. And then he asks, could this be our centromere? He says, well, it certainly is a cluster of alphoid sequences, but is it in the right place? Let's have a look at the genes on either side of this cluster. Because the prediction here is pretty simple, right? If the human chromosome 2 is basically a fusion of two ancient ape chromosomes, then the genes that surround the normal centromere should correspond with the genes that surround the normal centromere in chimp 2a and the genes that surround the cryptic centromere should correspond with the genes that surround the normal centromere in chimp 2b. Both regions should be analogous. So that's what he did. He looked at the cryptic centromere and plotted the genes that surround it in humans as well as the genes that surround the putative actual centromere in chimp 2b. So what you can see here on the far left is obviously the human genes that are found around this proposed cryptic centromere, and on the right are the homologs, or the genes that are similar or identical, in chimpanzees. These genes are one-to-one -one with single locations, and they both span a centromere. In the case of the human, it's the cryptic centromere, and in the case of the chimp, it's centromere 2b. This should not happen if the one in the human, if the series of alphoid repeats in the human, isn't a former centromere. The odds of this are statistically zero. Okay though, back to Ram Matt's challenge that he's posed here. If the fusion site in human chromosome 2 is actually a fusion site, and the regions in human chromosome 2 are supposed to be degraded, then moving backwards in time, they should probably get less degraded. So an older hominid, something like Neanderthals or Denisovans, should have a less degraded centromeric region, a cryptic centromeric region, and a less degraded fusion site than anatomically modern humans. Brilliant! Why haven't scientists tested this? Oh, they have? This is a paper titled Chromosome-Specific Centromere Sequences Provide an Estimate of the Ancestral Chromosome 2 Fusion Event in Hominin Genomes. It's by MEGA in 2017. The abstract summarizes really what they did. They note that the human chromosome 2 is a product of the telomere fusion between two ancestral chromosomes and a lost degradation of one of the original centromeres. That's our cryptic centromeres. Genomic signatures of this event are limited to inverted telomeric repeats at the precise site of the chromosomal fusion and to small amounts of relic centromeric sequences that remain on human chromosome 2. Unlike the site of the fusion, which is enriched for sequences that are shared elsewhere in the human genome, the region of the non-functioning and degenerate ancestral centromere appears to share limited similarity with other sites in the human genome, thereby providing an opportunity to study this genomic arrangement. In short, fragmented ancient DNA genomic datasets. Here, chromosome assigned satellite DNA are used to study the shared centromere sequence organization in Denisovan and Neanderthal genomes. By doing so, one is able to provide evidence for the presence of both an active, of both active and degenerate centromere satellite profiles on chromosome 2 in these archaic genomes, supporting the hypothesis that the chromosomal fusion event took place prior to our last common ancestor with Denisovan and Neanderthal hominins, and presenting a genomic reference for predicting karyotype in ancient genomic datasets. Wow, this is actually a really cool paper. But um, what they've done here is not of interest to us today for the purposes of debunking young earth creationism. So let's get to the good stuff. So first and foremost, why are they doing this with centromeres, with the cryptic centromere rather than the fusion site itself? Well, they talk about that right here. Both loci are defined by the prevalence of repeats, which confound standard mapping approaches aimed to investigate the genomic structure of these events in short-read ancient genomes. So it's actually just hard to sequence the fusion site itself in ancient genomes, whether it's too degraded or what's going on specifically there, um, I'm not exactly sure. Fortunately, the centromere is significantly larger and so offers a better opportunity to compare because it's less likely to be degraded, I guess. Beginning here in the results section, though, we have a nice, we have a nice validation of Ruhif's work. Uh, it says the relic centromere on human chromosome 2 is a 41 kilobase region enriched with degenerate alpha satellite DNAs. The placement of the ancestral centromere is parsimonious with syntonic gene order directly adjacent to the chimpanzee centromere located on chromosome 2b. So there you go, Ruhif. Validated 
Great job. Okay though, lucky for us, we're including the chimpanzee in our comparison here. What they've done is they've compared the chimp, human, Neanderthal, and Denisovans, cryptic centromere, and we as individuals reading this paper are analyzing it for raw mats hypothesis. We're seeing if there are portions of the Neanderthal and Denisovans cryptic centromere that share more in common with the chimpanzee than they do with the human, right? The idea is that if it's less degraded, it should share more in common with the ancestral condition. It should look a little bit more like the chimp than it does like the human in some cases. Now, we're not saying that they should be more similar to the chimpanzee, we're saying that they should be more similar to the chimpanzee than the human. Overall, they should be way more significantly more similar to the human for the simple reason that they're closely related to us by a lot, by millions of years, obviously. Um, and the genomes that we're sampling here are from Neanderthals and Denisovans that lived in the somewhat recent past, not ones that lived 400,000 or 700,000 years ago, within the last 100,000 years. Um, but we still want to see if Ramad is right. So let's let's continue on our, on our observation here. There's a, a section that I want to get to that answers the question pretty blatantly. And it's right here in this section, titled Hominin Centromeric Satellite Profiles are observed in similar proportions to modern humans, but distinct from chimpanzees. So yay, yes, they are distinct from chimpanzees. This is completely expected given Neanderthals and Denisovans are both around 99.7% similar to humans, significantly more than either of us is to chimpanzees. These guys are also, again, genomes that came from like 30, 40, maybe 100,000 years ago, so pretty dang recent. But you'll notice they didn't say identical, did they? They said similar proportions. So, um, uh-oh, Raw Matt, this is a big uh-oh, uh, uh-oh stinky moment for you because this sentence right here lays it out quite plainly. Based on this early assessment, all three ancient hominin genomes appeared to share more sequences with modern humans than with chimpanzees, with only 4.5% and 8% of sequences determined to be chimpanzee-specific in Denisovan and Neanderthal, respectively. The remaining greater than 90% of the sequences were human-specific sequences and or sequences shared between human and chimpanzee genomes. Um, so that means that 4.5% of the cryptic centromere in Denisovans and 8% of the cryptic centromere in Neanderthals were chimp-specific. They were less degraded, more similar to the chimpanzee. Uh-oh, Raw Matt. Oh no, this makes you look like a big dummy, doesn't it? This was a rookie creationist mistake. You're not supposed to put out ideas that are actually testable. You might be shown to be wrong. And if you're going up against evolutionary theory and the data exists, you will be shown to be wrong without exception. If it's degenerating that fast, great point about the Neanderthals, right? So you're saying the Neanderthal, if we could sequence this area, essentially it, it should be a lot more pristine since this would be hundreds of thousands of years ago than, than today, right? If you were to compare this site in extant humans and, and Neanderthals. Exactly. And the same could be done with Denisovan if we actually have any of their uh, DNA as, as far as that chromosome goes. I would imagine we might. We found quite a few. But think about it. We have Neanderthal fossils that supposedly go back 430,000 years right? So that's a long time ago. Therefore, some of their genetics should so show a much more pristine fusion region with much more telomeric repeats that according to them would have degenerated in modern humans 40, 430,000 years later. Just makes sense. Right. That's something they could run to prove us wrong. Consider it run and consider yourself wrong, Raw Matt. Now, one thing I do want to note here is they're saying that we would expect it to be like significantly closer to the ancestral condition. Perhaps if we were pulling from like 700,000 year old fossils, but the genomes that we have from Neanderthals are significantly more recent. As I said earlier, 100,000 years ago and earlier, like that's the latest push. It's actually remarkable that they still show the signature, that they still appear to be more towards the basal condition as compared to modern humans. Remarkable. Thank you, genetics, for hating on raw mat. What is it? That doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. This is more pristine. So maybe yeah. the fact that this is more pristine makes it suddenly an ancient fusion, because that's, that's a unique composition. You see what I'm saying? Why this whole density argument is just so arbitrary. It's so weak. It's so soft. It's so subjective. So yet again, the unique characteristics of human chromosome 2's fusion site are what make it a fusion site. They are diagnostic of that condition. I don't know how Donnie doesn't understand that unless he's intentionally not understanding it.
He doubles down in a second on quote mining from that 2002 paper. And like you guys, when they quote mine, your first job is to immediately go check. Like just go read the next couple of sentences, read past the abstract, read the results. Just go read the paper actually, because you know they didn't read the paper. So you read it yourself and see if the conclusions that they've presented are accurate representations. Cause creationists have like a phenomenal track record of not properly representing the results or even sentences found within uh, scientific papers. So fortunately, next, Donnie talks about something new, at least new for this video, and that is that functional, quote unquote, gene found that spans the fusion site, DDX11L2. And these arguments, he does crib from Tompkins. And the fusion site it itself, which isn't a fusion site as we're proving here, is essentially this functional component inside an essential gene. The DDX11L2 gene that's completely on fire and highly expressed. Matt, what do you say to the evolutionists that argue, oh, well, the DDX11L2, it's a pseudo gene. The activity there is just spurious. It's not really functional. You guys are just making that. This argument sucks, and the reason is fourfold. Number one, the gene that is proposed to span the fusion site does not do so in every read. Number two, the gene is categorically a pseudogene that is known for being barely distinguishable from noise and sequencing. Number three, genes can move locations in the genome, meaning even if it was a vital gene with a critical function, the fusion site could still be a fusion site. And number four, it belongs to a gene family called the DDX11L family, all of the others of which are exclusively found in telomeres. Yeah, that's right, even the functional gene that is supposed to make the case for these guys that this isn't a fusion site is a gene that is everywhere else in the genome exclusively found in telomeres. What is a telomere specific gene doing in the middle of a chromosome if not for a fusion event? But come on, let's hear these guys out. I would have to say, okay, well, first of all, where is it expressed and how is it expressed? This is a, a highly essential gene. It's doing a lot. If you did a knockout test of this in your body, it would cause problems. Oh, so it's a super important, critical, vital gene that's expressed in all of the different tissues, and if it were to go away, that would be super bad. What does all of this mean exactly? Well, when I got ready to get down and dirty with this concept, I found out that Glenn Williamson had once again beat me to the punch. But before we get to his work, let's appreciate who made this idea popular, that this functional gene negates a fusion site. I'll give you one guess. Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, he's done a fantastic job. Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, huh? Wow, throw the work in the trash. It means absolutely nothing. He's done a sophisticated analysis of the DDX11L2, but the evolutionists hate creationists, right? The second they hear, oh, creationists did this research, it's like now everything else is just gonna be in one ear and out the other. You know what though? I've never been one to ignore something or hand wave a point just because it sounds really dumb and is done by somebody who does not have a good track record for doing good science. So let's investigate it a little bit further using the work that Glenn Williamson has already done. So here's another one of Glenn's posts. <laughs> he quotes Ian Juby, who is pulling from Tompkins, uh, saying that DDX11L2 is critical for life and then cites where people are getting this from. It all comes from Jeff. All of the bad genetics pipelines lead to Jeff, unless they lead to Jeetson, which sometimes they do. So he breaks down the name. Uh, DDX stands for dead box. The 11L2 notes that there are 41 dead box helicase protein coding genes, like within the family. Uh, the L stands for like. Talks about the two, it's, it, he says DDX11L2 isn't found near telomeres, the modern human genome. It's all by itself in the middle of chromosome two. Make of that what you will. Um, but really what Glenn wants to do here is he wants to talk about how expressed this thing is, how vital is it? Um, and he notes what we've noted here before, which is that it's not like expressed in every single transcript. He says to break things down further, there are two transcripts of this pseudogene, uh, this one, which is the longer of the two and straddles the put it a fusion site and the shorter one where it doesn't cross the fusion site. So it doesn't always cross the fusion site anyways, but let's just say for argument's sake that it does. So to summarize, Glenn says, what we're talking about here is a solitary alternately spliced transcript from a pseudogene that is fairly similar to 17 other pseudogenes and those pseudogenes as a whole bear some resemblance to an actual protein coding gene, DDX11, which itself is a part of a larger family of 41 genes. And I would also like to note here that every single other one of the genes, with, of the pseudogenes, excuse me, within this family are found in 
telomeres. So he says, let's look at how frequently DDX11 L2 is expressed. If you click this link and he provides it, you'll see that cells in the testes express DDX11 L2 at a rate of 3.905 RPKM, reads per kilobase per million mapped reads, in the pituitary gland at 0.936, in the prostate at 0.893, and in the spleen at 0.882. Wow, that sounds impressive. That's a lot of numbers. You know, numbers, numbers can sometimes mean things. So he says, already we can see that the DDX11 gene expression levels dwarf those of DDX11L2 because he, he shows us where the expression data is for like the larger family. Um, and those ones are expressed at 8.477 in the pituitary, um, or excuse me, in the testes, 8.068 in the pituitary, uh, 9.212 in the prostate, and 10.047 in the spleen. So like approximately give or take um, 10 times as many. So that's a little important to um, to appreciate. But he says, let's look at some of the other DDX genes. So he, he marks them here and he says, wow, DDX5 is expressed almost 400 times more often in the spleen than DDX11 L2. So already we're getting some interesting reads as far as what DDX11 L2 is doing. Um, but I like this particularly here. If we look at ACE view, we can actually get a breakdown of how frequently the introns are sequenced in RNA sequence studies. The intron that corresponds to the fusion site was sequenced 682 times, while the intron common to both transcripts was sequenced a total of 3,186 times, implying that the longer transcripts make up 21.4% of the total DDX11 L2 transcripts. So it only spans the fusion site 21% of the time. That's um, important to note, boys, for a, for a critical, absolutely imperative to life gene. Uh, so he, he says, what do we make of this numbers? of these numbers. When Tompkins claims that DDX11 L2 is a highly expressed gene, we have to ask highly expressed relative to what exactly? Um, he goes, if you take into account the fact that the transcript spans the fusion site only makes up, the transcript that spans the fusion site only makes up 21.4% of the transcripts, then the DDX11 L2 gene is expressed only 5.7 times as frequently as the average gene. Critical for life, you guys. Imperative for survival. Um, absolutely ridiculous. He says, if you were to hypothetically split this chromos chromosome in half at the fusion site, you wouldn't be dead in a day, as Ian Juby likes to say. You would lose a very lowly expressed transcript of a pseudogene. That pseudogene is a part of a family of 17 other similar pseudogenes, which is a group bears some resemblance to an actual protein-coding gene. That protein-coding gene is then a part of a much larger group of protein-coding genes. And remember, the other pseudogenes in the family are all in telomeres. So is this thing critical for life? Highly expressed? The answer is a resounding absolutely not. This is a confirmed prediction. I want the audience to, am I still screen share? Let me make sure. Okay, yeah. good. I want the audience to understand that this right here is a, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, praise I am my brother, junk DNA, exactly. Junk DNA is junk science. Evolution, pawn scum to people evolution that is, is, is junk science. And so, um, Matt, we've done many, many predictions. We've had many novel predictions that have been confirmed. And that's what this is. Again, do I got to play Erica's video again? I mean, she literally says, no, what is Donnie talking about chromosome nine? Sure. You find the TTAGGG maybe in, 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 in uh, an independent location, but no, no, the, the chromosome two is the only place in the genome that you find them head to head. Donnie just loves to preen himself on camera and pat himself on the back for a job well done. Um, that's great that it was a confirmed prediction, but you tested something no one ever said. You double checked me on a point I never made. And ultimately you led me down a rabbit hole that shows your work with chromosome nine specifically actually makes the case for the fusion site at human chromosome two better, not worse. <sighs> that sucks. That's, uh, I mean. <laughs> because you've shown us that there is another head to head telomere sequence in the human genome, that it is not high density, that it is not degraded, that it is not located in the right portion of the chromosome being adjacent to the telomeres, and that it mimics ITSs or non-fusion intrachromosomal telomeric sequences in other species that don't have fusion sites anymore. This was going to be the end of things, but then Raw Matt says something particularly interesting and kind of disturbing. Protein coding genes are just more cherry picked because they're the ones that can 
that they can line up to prove their common ancestry. They don't like to compare them to the other regions of the genome. Matter of fact, they don't even like to compare some of the protein coding regions, which are regions to each other. Uh, they don't like to compare cytochrome C to cytochrome B because that also builds a different tree. So they have to just focus on one specific area to build a tree that they're specifically looking for and ignoring the data in all of the other regions. For example, I always like to point out that if you were to do a paternity test, what would you do? You would look at the Y chromosome, the mitochondria, or the autosomal DNA. That's it, because nothing else can prove ancestry. Okay, so this just portrays a complete lack of understanding of comparative genomics, genetics in general, and frankly, critical thinking. Unsurprising since it's coming from raw mat, but let's talk about it briefly in general. You absolutely can get different phylogenetic trees by comparing certain regions of highly variable sequences in the genome. Of course you can. This is because of genetic shenanigans like incomplete lineage sorting and various mutation rates. But this does not help young earth creationists. Imagine me, my sister, and our cousin. We share a lot of our genome with one another, passed down from our parents and our grandparents, don't we? Me and my cousin, though, have dangly earlobes while my sister has attached earlobes. This is a dominant Mendelian trait, by the way, represented in our genome. By just looking at the earlobe gene, me and my cousin are actually more closely related than me and my sister, aren't we? But that would be a nonsensical and stupid thing to do given the nature of that gene, which is why the best way to create phylogenies is to take the whole genome. When doing this, me and my sister show up as more closely related than either of us is to our cousin because we are comparing everything, the highest possible number of genes, all of them. And when we do this, we also show that me and my sister do differ in minor ways in our genomes because we are in fact different individuals. Those differences, however small, do make all the difference, but they don't change the fact that overall, me and my sister are ridiculously similar, more so than me and anyone else on Earth. This same thing is true for organisms at a species level. A dog and a wolf share so much with one another. Their genomes are ridiculously similar. But there may be some things that a wolf shares with a fox that a dog has simply lost in its own evolutionary journey. That doesn't mean a wolf is more closely related to a fox than it is to a dog, because when we compare their full genomes, all the genes, Foxes end up as the outgroup, excluded, because dogs and wolves share an enormous portion of their full genome. Remember this quote, the differences make all the difference. So they want to look to things like synteny and homology and just shared sequences and um, similarities in gene order across chromosomes and so on and so forth. But they don't want to focus on the differences. Isn't that right, Matt? This is objectively false. The search in genetics for human-specific genes is enormously popular. People are always trying to find what makes humans different from the other animals within the animal kingdom and specifically to our closest living relatives. The truth is, there just aren't that many of them. We are ridiculously similar to chimpanzees and bonobos, for instance. I would wager that the true differences are going to turn out to be epigenetic in nature. And I would wager that they're also going to stay pretty small differences. After all, a small genetic difference can make a large impact on the phenotype. The differences do make all the difference, as Donnie said. For instance, if me and my clone have a single nucleotide difference between the two of us, that difference literally does make all the difference. But that doesn't change the fact that the rest of our genome, all two billion odd base pairs, are the same are identical. And this brings me to the last point I want to make today. We've discussed the best support for the human chromosome 2 as a fusion site and compared it to human chromosome 9. Human chromosome 2 has a degraded but high density series of telomeric repeats located in the middle of the chromosome, a second centromere that has the same genes as chimpanzee centromere 2b, the similarities with other animals that have undergone telomere to telomere fusions, but there was one more part to the argument the synteny of the rest of the massive chromosome 2 with chimpanzee 2a and 2b. If I want to argue that one play is a fusion of two earlier plays, I might point to a couple of things as support for this case. I might point to the fact that there are shared errors located in the middle of the fused play that correspond to the beginning and end of the other two earlier plays. I might point to a shared second intermission located in the fused play. I might even point to examples of other fused plays that exist. But you want to know what the best support is that my fused play is in fact a combination of two earlier plays? The similarity that the fused play shares to the earlier plays. The overall similarities, the words, the paragraphs, the chapters, etc. The overall synteny. 
So I decided to test just that. Human chromosome 2 is 243 million base pairs long, while chimpanzee A and chimpanzee B total 236 million base pairs. So I took chimpanzee chromosomes A and B, selected 300 base pair long slices 100,000 times, totaling 30 million base pairs per run. And then I did that nine times to get full coverage overall. In fact, the total number of base pairs run was like 270 million, which of course exceeds the size of human chromosome 2. I think that's probably okay though, given each 30 million base pairs run was like a separate test, so there's probably some substantial overlap going on there. Still, I covered, I would say, the vast majority of human chromosome 2 with chimp chromosome 2a and 2b. It took over a week because every 100,300 base pair run, so every 30 million base pairs took about a day, and again, we did it nine times, so it took a long time, but I'll tell you, the total syntony of chimp 2a and 2b to human chromosome 2 was approximately 98%. So it's not just a high density series of telomeric repeats located in the middle of human chromosome 2. It's not just the second cryptic centromere that maps along with the genes in chimpanzee 2b. It's not just the similarities that this process had to other animals that young earth creationists accept experienced a fusion event in a telomere to telomere fashion. It's all of that plus a 98% similarity between the entire chimpanzee 2a and 2b to human chromosome 2. The differences make all the difference, but the similarities make the case. Okay, chromosome 2 fusion. Let's, let's quickly, in a nutshell, in a minute. Take a deep breath. Okay, so the so-called fusion sites, two degenerates, corrupt. It's only 798 base pairs, and guess what? It's overlapped by a highly functional and essential gene the DDX11L2 gene, the critics like Erica say, oh, it's just a pseudo gene. The activity there, it's spurious, it's noise. We've demolished that tonight in, a, in the article series. Anyways, the so-called uh, centromere, cryptic centromere, the centromeric DNA, the alphoid repeats. Guess what? Everything there, that so-called uh, signature, overlapped by, yet again, a highly functional and essential gene. So basically what we're looking at in terms of these so-called signatures are actually functional components or functional elements of highly functional and essential genes. Those telomeric repeats, they're found all throughout the genome, and they function in gene expression. They're necessary for the health of the cell. And we find instances of those sequences in both forwards and reverse. That's it. So it's not just that one thing. It's not like, oh, that's all you have. No, every aspect of the fusion argument has been contested. And would you agree, Matt, have been overturned? I'm always tickled by the confidence, aren't you? It's been overturned by a blog post that you made. I would say submit it to serious scientists at actual journals if you're so sure, but hopefully this video will dissuade you from trying to make that attempt and embarrassing yourself. Like I said, the argument for the fusion site is supported by every line of evidence imaginable. The high density series of telomeric repeats in the middle of human chromosome 2, the cryptic centromere that maps with genes on chimpanzee centromere 2b, the overall similarity to other animals that have experienced fusions, and of course, the ridiculous amount of syntony, 98%, with chimpanzee 2a and 2b overall. It's a fusion site. Arguments that there is a functional gene spanning the fusion site do absolutely nothing to deconstruct it, especially given it only spans the fusion site in like roughly 21% of transcripts anyways, but also genes can move around, and the DDX11L2 gene is found in every other part of its gene family exclusively in telomeres, so I would say if anything, the gene hurts the case that it isn't a fusion site. The video is full of other nonsense. Raw Matt takes like 40 minutes or something talking about all the differences between humans and chimpanzees or other apes, and it is almost verbatim the same list that I deconstructed from him literally years ago, so I'm not going to waste my time going over it a second time. He also complains that I don't post the debates that I've had with them on my channel. I don't post any of the debates that I've had on my channel because they're on other channels. If people want to see them, they can go see them. And I think this is weird, especially because like Modern Day Debate, where most of my debates with Donnie are, is a bigger channel than mine. What would me posting them a second time on my channel do, except siphon views away from the original channel it appeared upon? That's lazy. That would be very lazy if you were to do that. 
Then Donnie complains that he does all these midnight after shows and nobody ever comes. My brother in Christ, you host those in the middle of the night sometimes. And unlike you, this is not my job. This is my hobby. I have an actual job and it's called teaching at a university and also getting my PhD. I don't have time to drop everything and show up to talk to you and a bunch of your friends on a video that's going to get like 2000 views that I'm not gonna make any money off of. I just don't. I would love to be able to debate you into the night every time you host one of these after shows, but unfortunately I'm trying to get my doctorate and spend time with my family and friends. Oh, I forgot to mention this. He also says that I won't debate him for some reason. Dude, come on. In my previous video I outlined the reason and I also told you via email. It's because you have Kent Hovind on your channel and that guy is a criminal. Stop having him on your channel and maybe I'll have you on mine. When your through line to him can't besmirch my reputation. And I should say to people, I offered to debate Erica on this topic about a month ago maybe. And um, for whatever reason she didn't want to, so. Loser, loser. Do not want your viewers to know that that's the reason I won't debate you, Donnie, even though I've laid it out for you numerous times. You don't want them to know that? What a weenie. My gentle and of course very modern apes, I hope you enjoyed this video. I do have fun with these long and systematic debunks, and I always end up learning something new when I do them, so I guess I can thank Donnie and Ramat for that at the very least. If you like what I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon, or you can buy my merch at my respective merch stores. And uh, other than that, you guys, I'll see you in the next one.